Today we're going to be talking about mind control in the 21st century. Uh, but first, let's give a little bit of background on who I am. I'm Dr. Nick Begich. I was born and raised in Alaska. I have a doctorate in traditional and complementary medicines and a background in, in politics here in this part of the world. I've been active on these issues and issues on technology throughout the world. I've lectured in 22 countries all over the United States. I've worked with 200 radio and TV producers around the world um, to get these issues into the um, hearts and minds of folks so that we can really debate and look at what the potential is both on uh, the positive side of technology as well as some of the things that we all need to be concerned about and, and look out for. Here in Alaska, I also work as a tribal administrator uh, for Chickaloon Village, one of the federally recognized Native American tribes in Alaska. I worked as an administrator in public education. Uh, in the last 10 years, have been actively engaged uh, primarily in activist work surrounding these issues. Most recently, I was appointed executive director of the Lay Foundation on Technologies based in Dallas, Texas, to take technology issues forward, to educate the public, so that we can all be more informed as we move forward into this century. First, let me give a little bit of background on uh, this whole area. You know, the military's interest in this area goes back to the Korean conflict. Right after the Korean fo War, returning veterans, uh, prisoners of war, uh, had really unusual behavioral changes. In fact, as, as our military began to look um, at these guys and find out what was going on with them, we found out that huge uh, psychological transformations were made. Uh, these were made um, through lots of different methods, mainly affecting the emotions of folks. Uh, what happened as a result of this is our military and others became very interested in the idea of manipulating uh, human behavior for lots of different purposes. I mean, obviously, uh, in, in prisoners of war situations, the idea of interrogating folks where they're more uh, liable and susceptible to giving the information up uh, was the main en emphasis during the Korean conflict and, of course, was an, a, of interest to our uh, military as well. From the 1950s, things changed pretty dramatically. As we rolled into the 1960s, a lot of interest into the idea of electronically controlling uh, what happens within the human brain was being pursued. In fact, in the early part of the Vietnam War, back in uh, the mid-60s, a device called the LIDA machine, L-I-D-A, was captured from the uh, Russians. It was used in interrogating U.S. prisoners in Vietnam. And essentially what it was was an oscillating strobe light mixed with um, uh, auditory signals that actually caused what's called brain entrainment, the idea of the brain beginning to mirror or follow those external signals. And what this did is put people in a highly suggestive state and a state where they were more willing to give up intelligence. This particular device triggered a whole cascade of interest, primarily from Central Intelligence Agency. In fact, it was right after um, uh, this period of time in the early 70s that this whole adventure became the inter of interest to our U.S. Congress. Back in uh, 1975, the United States Congress uh, did a full analysis of what the Central Intelligence Agency was doing in the United States. And within that analysis, uh, they published this report. And this is a report on, uh, on the activities within the United States. And if people remember, the Central Intelligence Agency was supposed to be dealing with things only off of our shores, not within our boundaries. Now, in the 60s, the CIA was used for infiltrating student groups, getting involved in surveillance of everyone from the Congress all the way through activist organizations, individuals through the United States. During the same period of time, a huge controversy broke, and it was the MK Ultra, Ultra controversy. And this dealt with the idea of taking individuals utilizing primarily chemical means, LSD and other um, mind-altering uh, drugs, to see if you could alter behavior in a favorable way for military uh, adventures. In fact, the abuses that were um, uh, engaged at that time are actually spoken about in this congressional report. The sad story is that of all of the victims, thousands of military personnel used in these experiments as well as others, never once uh, was, a, was a government fully held accountable until one individual um, actually committed suicide. Uh, that resulted in a lawsuit that eventually was settled by the Central Intelligence Agency in favor of that individual who was subjected to this kind of experimentation. At Laurentian University in Canada, similar work was being done, really developing methods, protocols for influencing human behavior without chemical means. If you even go back 
um, to the 60s again for, for a few minutes. And let's talk about another guy. This guy was Jose Delgado. Jose Delgado put together this book. Uh, this is Physical Control of the Mind Toward a Psycho-Civilized Society. Jose had his degree in electrophysiology from the University of Madrid. He was granted his degree in 1950, and once um, achieving that, 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 that degree, he spent his time sort of mapping the brain, looking at what parts of the brain affect various parts of, of our behavior uh, and activity. What he found uh, was that the brain could be mapped, that you could actually implant um, electrodes within the brain and get a number of effects. And some of that he was doing with with primates, he was doing it with uh, with bulls um, as well. In fact, this image is is Jose Delgado with a charging bull coming at him. He threw a radio uh, transmitter, threw the switch on it, and basically stopped the bull, uh, not dead, but stopped it dead in its tracks, uh, where it stopped the charge. This was done in 1969. Now, back in 1969. Uh, Jose Delgado had left Spain, had come to the United States, was working primarily at Yale University uh, in this work where he continued his work until the mid-80s. What he found is that he was able to stimulate the brain utilizing an implanted technology and cause a number of effects in primates, uh, bulls, and even human beings. By the 1980s, he found that he didn't need uh, any physical contact uh, with the human brain. He just needed to oscillate or vibrate um, uh, energy into the brain in a very specific way. And what he found in 1985 was that you could create tremendous changes in human brain chemistry by oscillating energy in at one fiftieth of what the earth naturally produces in the radio frequency range. Now, if you think about that in a broader sense, how much radio frequency energy is around us right now at this moment is about 200 million times more than nature produces on its own. So take what nature produces on its own, cut it down to one fiftieth of that amount of energy, and that was what was sufficient to override uh, human brains and, and primates in such a way as to change them from, say, lethargic and passive to highly aggressive and agitated, almost like throwing on an awful light switch. This was documented in, in work at Yale University. Um, this work has also been documented in our books, uh, which is part of the basis of this series, the Earth Rising, uh, Earth Rising, the Revolution, and Earth Rising, uh, t t the Betrayal of Science, Society, and the Soul. And in these two books, we actually lay out over a thousand reference sources, laying out exactly where each, each bit of information comes from, primarily quoting mainstream media reports, academic studies, uh, unclassified military records, and, and work done in a number of institutions around the world. On this subject, we were also pretty, pretty impressed by the idea that finally one of the leading um, uh, publications in the world, The Economist, actually took this issue on uh, in this cover story from the end of May uh, 2002. And in this cover story, the beginning of the dialogue, the debate on the ethics of mind control, the ethics of artificially manipulating uh, the human brain uh, for, for military applications. If you take it a little bit further and we start to look at sort of what did the military do during the 60s that was the most impressive. The thing that, that struck me is, was not the chemical test because those are pretty obvious to everyone. It was the idea more in line with what Delgado and others were, were utilizing which was this idea of oscillating um, electromagnetic fields of various kinds. The radio frequency energy was being uh, as being one of those uh, primary movers. As we looked into the history of the technology, what we were able to find is over three dozen U.S. patents tra tracing the evolution from the early, um, the early 1960s primarily up until uh, the beginning of this century. And many of those you'll find available on the DVD um, as reference material that goes with this presentation because we want people to have those hard documents and access to that information directly. The other thing that I would say in terms of military applications uh, it became pretty interesting as we started to see the evolution of the technology and we started to see writers like Zbigny Brzezinski when he was at Columbia University take this issue on. If you go back to a book, this book, Between Two Ages, 
This was written by Brzezinski before he became National Security Advisor to Jimmy Carter when he was President of the United States. And within the context of this book, startling things uh, start to emerge in, in, in terms of the technology and where it's going. One in particular that was, was, was a, an interesting idea, the one, one fielded by a researcher named Gordon J.F. MacDonald, and I'll just read this short quote. He was a geophysicist specializing in problems of warfare, and this is what he, what he thought was possible. J.F. Gordon MacDonald, a geophysicist specializing in problems of war, has written that accurately timed, artificially excited electronic strokes could lead to a pattern of oscillations that produce relatively high power levels over, over certain regions of the Earth. In this way, one could develop a system that would seriously impair brain performance of very large populations in selected regions over, over an extended period, no matter how deeply disturbing the thought of using the environment to manipulate behavior for national advantages, to some the technology permitting such use will very probably develop within the next few decades. This was written in 1973, and in those last few decades that is exactly the technology that has emerged and the technology we'll be discussing today. Some of the other areas that, that became pretty interesting, and it wasn't just to us, but others were looking at this whole idea of, of weapons advancements and technology as it could affect human behavior on a, on a large scale covering the entire planet and then something much more narrower. The things that Brzezinski was talking about was this idea of being able to um, oscillate energy in such a way that you could create a signal that would return to the Earth in such a way as to alter behavior. How does that work? Let's talk a little bit about the mechanisms behind uh, brain entrainment and what exactly that means. Affecting human behavior, affecting the brain, can be done in a number of different ways. Uh, firstly, um, uh, you, you need to look at sort of what are the uh, predominant brain wave act activity within the brain and how does that uh, line up against what we generally know. Uh, let's, let's break it down into four areas. We're going to talk about um, alpha waves, beta waves, uh, uh, theta waves uh, and delta waves. And, and we're going to start with the deepest, deepest um, states of human consciousness. When you're totally knocked out, deep sleep, you're in this deep delta state, which is approximately one to four hertz or vibrations per second or pulses per second. Um, if, you looked at an, uh, if you looked at an EEG to look at that brain activity, you'd see this sort of pulsing uh, energy within this range of one to four hertz. The next level up is called theta. Theta runs between approximately 4 and 7 hertz, or pulses per second or vibrations per second. Uh, this is the place that most um, people are when you're sort of in between awake and asleep, where you're consciously dreaming but you're still um, unconscious, but you have that sort of in-between state. That's the theta state. This is where most um, three to five-year-olds spend most of their time. If you were to look at an EEG of their brains, this is where the predominant activity is, which gives um, gives a clear explanation of why sometimes it's difficult for young children to separate the imaginary world from the real world. It's because of where they generally live. But in this, in this same place of where their brains are, where they absorb tremendous amounts of information, you think of three to five-year-olds in terms of language skills, social behavior, the kinds of things they're learning, the other thing that happens is we shove kids into an early frame of learning where the brains aren't fully developed for the kind of academic studies uh, that many of us uh, push our kids into maybe a little bit too prematurely. As an example, in Europe, they don't even start children in school till usually seven years old versus the five and four-year-olds being started uh, in school in the United States and in preschool programs. Now, the next stage is the alpha stage. This runs approximately seven to 12 hertz. This is where you are uh, when you're in the zone, when you're focused, when you're um, as an artist or an athlete, where you're just at your optimum performance. For accelerated learning, for certain uh, particular uh, types of learning, this is extremely um, useful uh, brain range to be in. It's where you want to be uh, for intellectual work and creative work. The next level is beta. This is where you're actively engaged, um, thinking and learning. At the same time, um, there's a little bit more emotional content uh, in terms of the dialogue. As you get to high beta, you get into those agitated states or states where um, where we're not in as good a control of ourselves as we like to be. So the range, if you're looking at uh, children that, that function, say, at too high a beta, um, these are folks that are um, attention deficit disordered often cataloged uh, in that way. Also, if they're running 
theta, they're running too low of a frequency range. Oftentimes, we categorize children um, as uh, learning disabled. And yet, really what may be happening in many instances when we diagnose too early is the brain just hasn't fully developed to where the alpha rhythms and the beta rhythms tend to dominate uh, the waking state, which is, is where we want to be as adults. The interesting thing in terms of study is what was discovered early on, uh, originally by Delgado and others, was the idea that external fields, when they were coherent or rhythmic and followed very specific patterns, could override the activity of the normal brain. And this could be done uh, with uh, pulsating radio frequency signals, pulsating electromagnetic fields, uh, with um, oscillating light or pulsating light, um, and it could also be done with sound. Now, if you think about sound, sound waves and, and, and sound itself, for the human ear to perceive it, we don't perceive the very, very low frequency sounds. Um, Animals like elephants can perceive those low frequency sounds. Um, other animals uh, that have large receivers, ears that pick up those low frequency sounds can, can do that, but we can't. So what happens is the brain, not being able to hear below a certain range, cannot pick up these low rhythms that can cause brain entrainment unless you can create sort of a cancellation effect. And here's what's been developed. A gentleman named Robert Monroe back in the uh, late 1950s, early 1960s, discovered that if you sent sound into one ear at, say, 16,000 cycles per second or vibrations per second within the range of human hearing, and one in at, say, 16,007 in the other ear, so you have 16,000 coming in here, 16,007 coming in here, and they cancel within the brain and leave a beat frequency of 7 hertz within the alpha range, as an example, the brain locks onto that beat frequency, and this is called bioral beat. Um, it was actually patented by Monroe. Um, it was used to develop a number of technologies, but the real effect of bioral beat is pretty profound. If you look at this image, and this is an image taken from uh, the Monroe Institute, you can see a normal brain on this side, which the energy is distributed across the brain with one side, in this case, dominating, where the energy is focused in the reds and the yellows um, on one side of the brain. With bioral beats, you create what's called whole brain entrainment, where both hemispheres of the brain, both the creative side and the analytical side, harmonize and work together. This is the ideal state of learning, the ideal state for absorbing information, taking it into consciousness and committing it um, to long-term memory, and also having profound effects, uh, very strong effects, suggestive effects, um, on the human brain and, and subsequent behaviors. As a result, over 60,000 people were tested at the Monroe Institute utilizing um, this technology and actual um, tapes and CDs were developed for creating very specific behavioral effects for enhancing human performance, not for necessarily military applications, but for civilian applications um, in a number of areas. And we'll talk about that as we go on uh, through this presentation today. The, the main interest, again, um, of many was the idea of being able to enhance performance. I mean, consider the fact that um, brain activity in young children, how do we moderate that now? I mean, when kids are hyperactive, we drug them. When they're attention deficit disordered for other reasons, we drug them. And the idea there is, is to get them to slow down enough in order to make the kinds of um, intellectual processes work so that things do work properly. Now there's other ways to accomplish this, and one of the most outstanding programs in the country was actually initiated in a charter school in the Minneapolis School District. Minneapolis School District set up a charter school where they only allowed children in, essentially, who were attention deficit disordered. Eighty percent of the children were on Ritalin, a drug used, again, to modify their behavior so they can learn. What they found is using a technique called brain biofeedback or neurobiofeedback that they were able to modify um, the, these children's brain activities in this way. Essentially, it was a, a, a computer screen that would have like a visual image that a young child could um, relate to, more, more like a game than anything else. So you get a bouncing ball, for instance. The kid would be wired up. He'd have a 16 or 8 or, or eight channel EEG plugged onto his head, so he'd have all these points 
covered on the head. Now they make really cool little helmets. They look like a bicycle helmet, so kids will tolerate them without all the electrodes stuck to them. Um, but it's a nice little arrangement where they look at the screen, and as their brain hits the right range for that ideal state of learning, the ball will bounce. And the higher it bounces, the more into that zone the child's brain activity um, is. And what they have found is that with 30 to 40 one-hour sessions with each child, they're able to actually train the child so that they can literally go into that ideal state of learning at will. In other words, they don't need the biofeedback apparatus. It's like a training tool. It's the same as if you try and learn how to ride a bicycle uh, out of a textbook. It's not going to work very good when you get on it the first time. But if you get on that bicycle and you fall down two or three times and you learn how to ride it at five or six years old and you never picked up a bicycle again until you were in your 20s and you grab that bicycle, you would immediately have laid down those necessary learning tracks to pick it up because of that feedback you get from the experience of actually all of your sensory um, perceptions being engaged in the learning activity. When you look at brain biofeedback, it's essentially the same kind of focused learning that allows you to retain, lay down those tracks so that you can go there at will. What did Minneapolis School District find out? After the first year, 80% of the student body was off of Ritalin, off of all psychoactive drugs. We're able to move gradually back into regular education programs, not needing uh, the special education um, resources uh, that otherwise would be demanded throughout their uh, 12 years of K through 12 education. Now, why is that important? Obviously, for the individual, I think it's obvious. But as, as taxpayers and people concerned about what goes on in our communities, special education is one of the biggest growing costs around the country. It's something that other school districts should be act actively engaged in. And it's something that you, as a, as a listener uh, to this DVD, could become an activist of one. Contact the Minneapolis School District get information on this program and get it into your local school district. You'll help a lot of kids and you'll reduce costs in your communities and actually began to see technology applied in an educational environment. Now since Minneapolis had started this program, a number of school districts around the country are starting to uh, duplicate that program and bring it in uh, into the mainstream. But you know it's taken 20 years from the discovery of the technology to actually getting in to an educational environment where it might be useful. And if you ask uh, people involved in, in, in children's issues, this is probably one of the most important issues facing uh, children in public education around the country today. When you, when you look back on, on Monroe's work, you know, Monroe was doing some interesting things. He was trying to stimulate the brain, not just for learning applications, but also layer, layering uh, the information you would actually see a brain wave was actually put on uh, the material in such a way that the brain actually would lock onto that, that, that external signal. Now the other thing that, that Monroe uh, and others discovered is that you could combine bioral beat with flickering light. And let me give you an example. Most people think of the television set as a uh, light radiator is pretty harmless. You know you get back 10, 15 feet as most of us do and you watch a television set and it's pretty safe. Everyone says, you know, it's what's called non-ionizing radiation, radiation that doesn't generate a lot of heat. You're so far from it uh, and the way energy spreads out, as it spreads out and you get further away, the density or concentration of energy decreases dramatically. This explains why on a television set when you come up real close and you put your hand on that screen, you can feel that energy radiating but as you back off it gets less and less dense pretty rapidly within just a few inches. If you think about uh, radio frequency energy being broadcast from a radio transmitter, you know when it starts out and you're close to the transmitter, you hear the signal real clearly and the further and further and further you get away, the less dense that signal is and the weaker the signal becomes. When you think about um, energy oscillators and light in particular, think back um, a number of years ago, in fact now it would have been in the late 1990s, there was an incident in uh, Japan where actually children, 700 children watching a television cartoon, uh, actually went to the hospital with epileptic seizures. What caused those epileptic seizures when light is supposed to be harmless, particularly that coming off of a television? It was the flicker rate. That's what was determined. The rate in which a certain segment flickered or pulsed, it struck what's called a window frequency. Within the range, there are certain frequencies like dialing up a radio. In between you get static, no signal, 
no clear resonance between transmitter and receiver, yet when you hit the station, you get a nice clear signal. The same is true within our physiology, within our brains and within our bodies. Most energy is static between the stations, but when you hit that window frequency, you can trigger this cascading chemical reactions uh, within the human brain. In that case, it, it took 700 children uh, to the hospital with energy otherwise thought to be harmless. Capitalizing on this knowledge, people have developed technology that focuses in on those window frequencies for enhanced human performance, whether it's to help you sleep, to cause you to slow down, relax, and go into those deeper states of sleep, or whether it's to perk you up, to gain energy so that you can move forward in a day with a lot more vigor and a lot more energy, or whether it's for those accelerating learning applications where in the background you could be either playing by oral beat or you could be utilizing this technology to feed information in, putting the brain into that ideal state for learning, and then bringing the information in in a way that the brain can absorb it readily, retain it, and, and actually be able to use uh, that, that information in a much more effective way uh, in the future. The other place is, is just general meditation, where people want to get into those deep states of meditation, where they open their consciousness to their more creative capacities. And these are essentially the ways in which these technologies have evolved. And they've evolved in a number of different directions. Light and sound devices, and we're going to demonstrate some of that a little bit later. Um, electrocranial stimulation, using electromagnetic fields to stimulate the brain. And we'll demonstrate what that looks like a little bit later. And also, the, the concept of biofeedback, being able to get a signal in and being able to understand that signal in a way that causes us to slow down or to um, be able to learn how to relax. Stress is probably the single biggest killer in the world today. If you really look at stress-related illness, whether they're uh, psychologically based or physically based, um, stress is the root of many of the illnesses we see today. And as our uh, societies become more complex, the tools for relaxation become extremely important. So we're going to get into a little bit of that as we go through the day. The other area that gets interesting is this whole idea of electromagnetic fields affecting our body. And you know, this is a source of a lot of controversy and a lot of serious science. You know, behind me are a number of books and publications on bioelectromagnetism, electromagnetic fields, um, power line cover-up, cell phones, lots of information that has been published um, some in the mainstream uh, science community and, and, and other in just the mainstream media reporting on the findings. And, and what is being reported today is pretty exciting stuff. The opportunities to enhance what we are as human beings, to become more complete. I mean, if you think about right brain, left brain arguments, you know, that, that went on in the, I remember mainly from the 80s where everyone was saying, you know, Women are more creative, so they, do, they have one portion of the brain that dominates, whereas men are more analytical, so another portion of the brain that dominates. And if you really look at, at these uh, EEGs and, and brain activity within human beings, you will see exactly that. But does that mean that one side or the other side uh, should be more dominant? It's really a function of our education system. If you look at young children, you see a more balanced um, hemispheric balance between both sides of the brain, the creative and the analytical. As we go through formal education, we tend to drift one way or the other and become channel locked into what parts of the brains dominate. Ideally, both sides work together, the analytical and the creative, and the idea of enhancing performance on both hemispheres is the objective of, of, of the science of uh, controlling the mind for your own advancement. Understanding a little bit more about the body and energy interactions with the body, you know the, the chemical model was the dominant model of the last century. This was the idea that everything that happens within our physical health and within our mind is related to chemical uh, interactions. What's being, what was a, really a big controversy toward, towards the end of the last century and, and, and not so much in the beginning of this one, is the idea that energetically what happens to us has profound effects on, on our health and our, and our psyche. If you think about the body, um, not some, so much from the chemical compounds to, uh, to body cells, to body components, to body, but go a little bit deeper. Think about the body first energetically. Energy, atoms, molecules, collections of atoms, chemicals, body parts, and then body. Starting at the very lowest level, energy can have a profound effect 
in terms of how our bodies work. And sort of the dividing line between the sciences. You know, often um, the folks that had really strong math skills and capabilities in mathematics went into physics and quantum physics. Those that had lesser math skills but had good science minds tended to go uh, more towards the uh, chemistry and the uh, physiology and the health fields, other areas. And that break point really segregated the knowledge in a way that was not a good, good idea in terms of the West because we lost the understanding of what was happening behind those chemical reactions and how you might be able to manipulate chemical reactions not with other chemicals but just using energy itself. Now the military actually commissioned a study back in the mid-80s. It was done through the University of Utah and it resulted in the Radio Frequency Dosimetry Handbook published in 1985. Now this handbook was actually put together to just look at radio frequency energy and its effect on our, on our health and on our mind. And what they were able to find is that every major organ of the body, including the brain, the heart, the liver, the lungs, could all be interfered with or overridden by external signals in the radio frequency range within a very narrow bandwidth. In other words, again, looking at the analogy of the radio station and dialing through the stations, when you have resonance, a correspondence, a harmony between the transmitter and the receiver, that's where the energy exchange happens, that's where the action is. For a radio station, it means a nice clean sound. In the case of the human body, it means the efficient operation of an organ or the interference with its efficient operation for military advantage. Now, some people will remember seeing some of the devices that were uh, announced at the very end of the last decade, one of them for riot control purposes, and it was a microwave a transmitter mounted on the Humvee, and it was used for creating the sensation of heat energy on the surface of the skin. You know, and when you think about creating heat energy, what was it doing? It made you feel like you had 130 to 140 degrees uh, temperature, very irritating. Um, you know, in fact, burning the last time it was used to modify uh, human behavior was back in the Middle Ages, and we kind of gave that idea up of it as inhumane. But we brought it back. Now, what they didn't tell us about that particular device is that same radio frequency energy, if you oscillate uh, or you change the oscillation or the frequency, if you change the waveform and power densities or any other any of a number of perimeters, you can create much different effects. The Radio Frequency Dosimetry Handbook commissioned by the United States Air Force explains what those varying effects are, whether it's interfering with the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, or in fact just um, controlling behavior by agitating people uh, in terms of creating the heat sensation. But the idea of the military moving into this realm has, has become really uh, moved from the area of science fiction to science fact. In fact, uh, after 9-11, some other interesting ideas started being fielded. One of them was um, utilizing the knowledge of the brain um, to really look at, in the same way you walk through a metal detector to find out whether you're carrying the gun, uh, the, the idea was being put forward uh, by, by a group of electrical engineers that what we could do um, is capture the signal intelligence. In other words, the brain activity of those passing through a receiver so that we could actually look at people that were experiencing high degrees of agitation or fear, the kinds of emotions that might make um, someone more of, a, of an interest uh, before they board a plane. Although I think a lot of people have fear of flying, so you'd get a lot of false reads as well. But these are the kinds of ideas that are being kicked around uh, by military planners around the world. When you think about, again, the body as a, uh, in terms of its energy and the way we relate to energy, this is a very, very important concept. And it goes back to the very ancients. You know, earlier in this presentation, I talked about the idea that around us is 200 million times more radio frequency energy than the Earth naturally produces. That radio frequency energy has been made by mankind and only includes one very small part of this continuum called the electromagnetic spectrum. When you add up all the energy that man has added into an environment, it's a tremendous difference. The idea of um, uh, being immersed in a sea of energy and not really sensing it or noting it, I'll tell you when you really see the difference. When power grids shut down, most people immediately notice how quiet it is because the refrigerator's not humming, the fan motors aren't humming in your computer, and so on. But if you think of the general state of your body when the energy fails, it's almost like you've exhaled. 
as your whole body relaxes. Think about it the next time the power goes out. Or if you want to run an experiment at home, go to your circuit breaker in your house and break the power coming into your house and notice the difference as your body relaxes. Because your body constantly has to create equilibrium. So a certain level of stress is created within our physiology, within our bodies, to mitigate, to compensate for those external fields that dominate so much of our lives today. I mean, just in the room that I'm standing in today, we are surrounded by a 60 hertz grid, 60 pulses per second. This is in the high beta range. This is an agitating range for the human body. And so we're always in this constant state in the United States and Canada where we have 60 cycles, where we're always just a little bit on edge, and we only notice the change when the power goes out. The other thing that you notice is the connection. When you think about what do most of us do when we walk into our house? We kick off our shoes. Why do we do that? People say, well, I feel more relaxed. Why do you feel relaxed? When you think about the insulators on the bottom of your feet, you're separated by the ground, uh, you're separated from the ground. The earth has a natural oscillation, a natural pulse. It's called Schumann's resonance. It was discovered uh, in Germany and Munich in the early 1950s. And the pulse rate of the planet is 7.83 hertz. 7.83 hertz, right in the middle of the alpha range, the ideal state for human learning, the ideal state for a creativity, and it happens to be the literal pulse of this planet. As we separate ourselves from that and lock on to those stronger energy fields now that are 60 cycles and higher, it explains a lot of the general stress that we see manifesting itself in the industrialized world that doesn't exist in the, uh, in, the, in the less industrialized parts of the planet. So that's an important consideration. Now, there was a, a segment that was run on the Discovery Channel a number of years ago, and it was on the Iceman, and many will remember this. They found this guy up in the uh, northern Italy, southern Germany, or Switzerland, depending on whose, whose side you're on on the argument, because apparently it was right on the border. And melting out of a glacier was this, a person that was 5,000 years old. Well, they began to look at what he was carrying, and, he, and they discovered that he had medicinal herbs and other things that we know about today, but we didn't know that they had this knowledge 5,000 years ago. As they were doing the autopsy on this man, what they found also was a number of tattoos covering his body. It just so happens that one of those people in the autopsy room noticed that these tattoos lined up with acupuncture points and acupuncture meridians. So they decided to take a look and see if this person actually had illnesses or disorders that were associated with those acupuncture points and acupuncture meridians. Not surprisingly to me, but surprisingly to, to those that were in the room, was in fact that knowledge was there. These points absolutely correlated. This reminds me of another story, and I'll, I'll tell you the story, and then I'll bring the two together. A good friend of mine was a physicist um, specializing in, in the effects of... Um, electromagnetic energy on the human body. His name was Reho Michaela. And Dr. Michaela uh, lived in Finland. Um, he did a lot of work in uh, Australia. He did a lot of work around the world, but was extremely well known in his part of the world for understanding uh, the interactions between energy and human health. During his early work in the 70s, he began to, to take a look at mapping the human body. And what he discovered is all over the human body, there were places where our skin resistance differed. In other words, where there were concentrations of energy versus no concentration. He began to map these. He brought in graduate students, and this was done at Queensland University uh, in Australia. And what he found was that as he brought people in, tested them, that everybody manifested these exact same concentration points of energy. And he began to map them. He mapped the front and the back of the body through a number of years. And one day a guy came into his, in, into his study and said, Dr. Michaela, why do you have an acupuncture chart on the wall? And, and Dr. Michaela laughed and goes, no, no, this is my work. I've been doing this for two years, measuring skin resistance on the surface of the body, the electrical properties on the surface of the skin. And the next day, that student went away and he brought one of these old uh, charts in. And this is uh, an, an interesting illustration. It's one of these kinds of diagrams. These are by the uh, ancient Chinese. We go back uh, thousands of years, but not 5,000 years, not the age of the Iceman. So where did the Iceman in Europe have the same knowledge as those in China? Back 
separated by thousands of miles as well as thousands of years. And this is what this is what my theory is, and this is strictly a theory, and I want to differentiate that from factual information, because that's what theories are, ideas that may help explain what we otherwise don't understand. Now, the arguments that we, we, we heard was, well, gee, how did the Chinese get the information into Europe? Or how did the Europeans get the information into China? How about this idea? Take away all the background noise all of the things that we've created as mankind, take them out of the picture. And perhaps human beings, some human beings, were highly sensitive, were able to differentiate on the surface of the skin these very, very subtle differences uh, that Rejo Michaela discovered um, 2,000 to 5,000 years after Europeans and Asians. Now let's go back and let's talk about this basic idea. This, this instrument this is um, a pointer plus, and this is actually an, uh, um, an acupuncture tool that has two functions. Its first function is to locate the points, to locate the acupuncture points on the body accurately by measuring the differences in the electrical properties on the surface of the skin. As an example, an acupuncture point on the index finger, on this side of the finger now, is, is well known and, and is charted in, in all of the charts, whether they go back to ancient China or, or modern, uh, the modern world. This device, uh, the Pointer Plus, is actually an, an, an electroacupuncture device. And the first thing I want to show is, is how it actually detects a point. And this will make um, a loop. So there's power coming through here, and there's a, a, a circuit that's completed um, if, I, if I actually go all the way around. So let me turn it on. There's power circulating through, and I'm locating a point. And when I hit that point, I get an auditory signal and I get a bright light. Now what I can also do is by depressing this trigger mechanism I actually send energy into that point that I perceive as a very very light um, almost like the dusting of a feather just a little slight pulsing sensation. If it's more than that the power is too high and it becomes uncomfortable. But basically what I'm doing instead of needling I'm sending in just a little bit of electrical energy to stimulate that particular point. But all of the points on the body can be found utilizing an instrument like this. Now, this is sort of the modern uh, uh, equivalent of those sensitives that could actually locate those points by their, their hypersensitive touch or their electronic sensitivity and be able to detect those very subtle differences. Because these acupuncture points don't line up with the normal nerve bundles. They don't line up with um, uh, muscle tissue. Um, they don't line up with um, the, the circulatory system or the, uh, of the body in terms of moving the blood around. This is a fourth system, the energetic system of the body, well known now and well understood. The place where I got my, my doctorate in traditional and complementary medicine was actually founded by a gentleman, Anton Jarasaraya, who was the first WHO fellow, World Health Organization fellow, to go into China and study acupuncture in the 50s and bring it back to the West in the 60s. But it wasn't until probably the latter part of the 1980s that the mainstream science finally accepted what the ancients have known forever. That affecting the energetic system of the body as a starting point is where health uh, practitioners in Asia uh, started and where they continue to operate today. This is probably the area where the most exciting breakthroughs in science uh, will emerge in our lifetimes. The idea of electrophysiology, electromedicine, will be the mainstays replacing what we've seen in the pharmaceutical models and the chemical models of the last century. That's what I think we need to look forward to, and in looking forward to that, it becomes a whole different system of addressing health. Uh, unlike chemicals, which work very quickly, this type of approach to health tends to take a little bit more time, and it's not just the effect of um, affecting the energetic system of the body, but also making sure the body has the basic nutrients available to it through the foods we eat or the supplements we take, again getting back to the things that we've sort of lost in our modern diets. We need the right building blocks in the body, then we need to be in the right energy state to take advantage of those building blocks to build um, uh, a healthy body and a healthy mind. And that's what the future offers and a lot of what we're going to be talking about today um, is about. This particular device is one that that we think is quite useful, um, has been used all over the world, and there's lots of different versions of this, and we'll show another version of this as we get through the day.